Hey guys, it's Mike the Alpha Hoarder here, and I've got some mail I want to open and see what I'm adding to my hoard today. And while I do that, I thought we could chat a little bit about liquidity and uh, profiting from collectibles. A lot of people are into the finance side of magic, and a lot of people like to sit on these, you know, these cards long term. Um, or some people do flipping and there's some implications to all that that I just think are worth spelling out and uh, I don't know that a lot of people take the time to spell it out so liquidity refers to how easy it is to convert an asset back into fiat money so small specialized markets like collectibles are going to have a lower liquidity. And so if you need to sell something quickly, you can increase liquidity by lowering your price. Excellent. An alpha card makes my day. How's the sleeve? I don't keep dirty sleeves. Not bad. Not bad. That lamp. <laughs> what weird art. So much going on in there. So anyway, magic cards are very illiquid. And it can be misleading to see what cards are selling for on the market. And I'm talking more about some of these, the, this rarer stuff, higher end stuff. Just because you see, you know, this card sell for 200 bucks. If you have three of these, that doesn't necessarily mean you're sitting on 600 bucks. Um, and it's especially true if you've got cards at volume. And that's because the market depth for collectibles is very shallow uh, and market depth refers to how well the market can uh, soak in um, a, a, a big uh, supply or demand change basically good old jump another one for this the stash Ooh, it's a good one All right, two alphas. Great start. So anyway, um, it's a really bad idea to be leveraged on illiquid assets. Whoa. That's a lot of stamps. It's a really bad idea to be leveraged on illiquid assets. And the reason is, if you need to sell in a hurry, the only way you're going to be able to move the asset back to fiat is by dropping dropping your asking price um, possibly a lot especially if you have multiple copies each copy might have to come down to meet the next highest bid and so you can end up losing quite a bit of money on what you thought your cards were worth as you chase the bids down and likewise it is a very bad idea to have emergency funds tied up in assets like this Everyone listening should have an emergency fund account because things in life go wrong and you need some money put aside. It's always sad to hear how many people uh, would, would be destroyed by, you know, a $1,000 medical bill or something. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's really something you need to plan for. And if you do have that money, and you put it into something like magic cards, you could be in for a real problem. Because when that emergency hits, you're not going to be able to liquidate the asset quickly and get your money back. You're gonna end up with a lot less money than you wanted. Very clean.
There's been a good couple of listings recently. Nicely centered too. This might actually be a condition upgrade for the binder. I have to go take a look. This one too. Very happy with that. So if you're ever unwinding an illiquid asset and you're trying to do it quickly, you're going to end up losing a lot of money off your expected value. So you want to make sure you're only using money that you're not going to need in a hurry. Money that's truly extra. Discretionary spending money above and beyond your your standard investments and your emergency funds and definitely don't be leveraged. Not the best fireball, but I got this one pretty cheap for a fireball. So I'm, I'm okay with it. And then assuming you are, uh, you are investing in this properly, you're not leveraged. Um, you're not tying up money that you might need to get to in a hurry. There's still some algebra you have to run to figure out what your collection is actually worth. And one thing that I've come to understand is that the, the market value of your cards is not actually what your collection value is. The replacement value of your collection is, is not actually what your collection value is. And the reason for that is, related to the last point, you're going to need a buyer. And there are limited buyers available for some of this stuff. And you never know if, if the, next, the next bid is lower than, than you know, the, the current bid. And so, oh, I remember this. So not only do you need to worry about the availability of buyers, but you have to take into account a whole bunch of other things that, that come into play once you actually do make a sale. So for example, the platform you sell on is going to take maybe a 10% fee. Um, processing payment is typically two and something percent, call it 3%. Cool little artist sketch here. His signature looks different every single time, or else this is fake, who knows. It's cool though. It's on an alpha card, that makes me happy. You're gonna have shipping fees. You need to account for some, some percentage of your transactions are gonna you know, get lost or um, be hit by fraud. Uh, you know, you'll have to experiment a bit to see what percent that is, but call it a single digit percent. And then if you make any money on the sale, above and beyond your cost basis, you're gonna get a hit with capital gains. So even as the market appreciates on a lot of these cards, you know, I said it in one of my first videos, I think alpha commons in good condition are a hundred bucks each. And the market is getting there, uh, way more so than a year or two years ago, but it's not there yet. I think they are. Um, but just because a card goes up, say, like say I get this for 50 bucks. Say, well, make the math a little easier. Say I got this for 100 bucks and today's price is 200 bucks. So you might be thinking I just made $100. But it doesn't work that way. You have to take 10% off for your platform fee. That's 20 bucks. 3% for processing, that's another six bucks. Shipping, the fraud. And then another 15% off, say, for uh, assuming it's a long-term capital gain. I, I'm not an accountant. Um, I employ a couple accountants, so I, I hear some of this, but you know, ask a real accountant if you wanna know. But basically, if you sell a card that you acquired less than a year ago, that's a short-term capital gain. And that's gonna be taxed in the same tax bracket as your regular income. So the more money you make, 
the more you're going to be taxed on that capital gain. If you've had the card for more than a year, it's a long-term capital gain. In that case, I think it breaks out into three brackets. Um, again, based on how much you make, but I, I think I think at the lowest there's zero percent, and then I think it goes to 15 maybe, and then 20. You gotta look that up. But uh, say it's 15 percent. So I had a card for 100 bucks, say, sold it for 200. Uh, I'm down to like 174 after uh, shipping and um, platform fees and processing fees, and then another 15% is gonna come off when I have to report that as capital gains. And so I end up making $63 on a card that I thought was gonna make me 100 bucks. So I lost a third of the margin just to move the card. And you know, that, that could be fine. You know, for if a card went from 100 to 200, then you know, that's probably fine. But uh, I see a lot of people kind of tracking tracking their collection on some of these sites and they watch as the price moves up you know five or ten percent and that's just not enough movement to offset the costs that you're going to take on by liquidating that card and so as soon as you make a purchase into collectibles you need to be willing to sit on it for long enough that it appreciates beyond the, the costs that are going to be associated with with liquidating that card, converting it back into fiat. And so as long as you're doing all that math, you'll be fine. But, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure people really think that through. I, I see some sometimes in these box breaks channels, you know, they'll just add up the, the price of each of the card that comes, you know, pops out of the box. And I, I guess that's probably fine for you know, more modern cards, which which sell pretty easily. But, uh, you know, I just think it's more complicated than that. I don't think you can just punch in your cards, what they're selling, track that over a couple of months or even just a year, and then think that you, you've got money sitting in the bank. Um, you might, you might not. It's going to depend how liquid those particular cards are, which will govern um, how how readily you can insist on, on the market price that you're seeing today. So for instance, if you did a buyout, you know, maybe you saw my, my video about Ashnod's uh, Transmogrant. Um, if I wanted to sell all those, for instance, there's no way I'd be getting market value in all of them. The market depth is too shallow. And so you just can't do the math as simply as some people like to do it. You have to account for whether you're going to be able to liquidate, whether you're going to be able to liquidate at the market price or whether you're going to end up chasing that, chasing down the bids. And then after you've done that, each of those sales is going to have to produce enough margin to offset all of the other fees and taxes associated with, with selling, selling these assets. So anyway, none of this is financial advice, of course. I'm just an idiot in a basement talking to myself and staring at cardboard. But if you're going to invest money, do your research. Make sure you know all the variables. Thanks for tuning in to today's video. If you enjoyed it, then perhaps you could make sure to always say no pun intended after every single sentence which contains no pun, and which you intended not to contain a pun. I would find this really helpful. Thanks again. See you guys next time.